I'm back. Mr. Clark's back. Time to take a look at World War One. World War One was originally known as the Great War, as you can see there in the visual. Uh, the Great War was the first total world war, and it was called the Great War. It wasn't until uh, after World War II came to a conclusion, and historians are getting ready to write about World War II, that they relabeled or renamed the Great War, World War I. So if you read or hear any times uh, the war references the Great War, you know that's uh, referencing uh, World War I. Before we actually go into some of the questions, normally if we're in an in-class situation, uh, like we were supposed to be, uh, you'll be giving this assignment kind of separately from the regular focus questions where you kind of do almost like a do now or brainstorm yourself. So kind of think about that first question before I go through the responses, before we're looking at the war, what are some of the things you know about the war? So just kind of think for yourself what you know about World War One or the Great War, whether it's fighting techniques, where it was fought, when the United States got involved, things like that. What are some things you want to learn about? Maybe you want to learn about the weapons and the soldiers, maybe the tactics that were used. Question two, list some things that can lead nations into the war or into war itself. So kind of think things that are obvious. What will be the most obvious reason why we get involved in a war? You're attacked. So if a country is attacked, they respond back and they defend themselves. Other reasons. What are some economic reasons you might get involved in a war? What about diplomatic reasons? So when you think about some of the things that could lead nations into the war, <clears throat> defending yourself, and what if you have an ally or a friend that gets attacked? Maybe you honor an alliance. During this period of time of the late 1800s, we were dealing with a period of time known as imperialism. Imperialism is obviously a uh, period of time where countries were attempting to add territory to their holdings, adding colonies. Some argued they needed additional living space or land space to live. Financially, you might need resources or materials. Question three, list actions or events that took place around the world in the years preceding the start of World War I. So when you think about some of the political events that were ongoing and the militaristic events. So when you look at this period of time, so we're dealing with the late 1800s and early 1900s. You had the Industrial Revolution. You had nationalistic movements. So in the middle to late 1800s, so by, let's say, the early 1870s, both Italy and Germany went through a period of time where they went from being separate individual like city-states, kind of fragmented in nature, to united countries. So we had Germany with Otto von Bismarck and Prussia kind of bringing together the other German states and a greater united Germany. In Italy, we saw Garibaldi and Cavour kind of come together and bring Italian states together in a greater reunited Italy. We had the age of imperialism and the age of empires. So when you think about the late 1800s and early 1900s, what were some of the things that nations were doing that's going to make the world a little bit more dangerous? Well, some of these ideas of colonization and imperialism. Also, too, if you want to take over another country, what do you need to build up physically? You need to increase the size of your military. You have to build up your weapons for war. So nations were becoming more aggressive, more militaristic, building up their militaries. They were forming alliances. With industrialization means you're modernizing your factory system, your ability to produce weapons for war increases. An alliance, hopefully you know what an alliance is. What are the purposes of an alliance? <clears throat> an alliance is basically a friendship or an agreement to help each other in times of war. They provide protection. However, on the negative side, they could make nations a bit more aggressive. They could be used to intimidate enemies.
nations sometimes become more aggressive because they know if they get in trouble, their friend or their ally potentially could bail them out. So if you go to war, this makes a nation a kind of bit, tiny bit more aggressive. And then alliances too could create chain reactions. So if there were no alliance systems, no alliances in place, two countries go to war, well, those two countries fight and whoever wins and whoever loses would be the outcome of the war. But alliances bring other countries into the mix. So often different nations who are involved in alliances, alliances, they could be kind of intertwined. So a small regional conflict could quickly become a much larger scale war. So hopefully it did okay with some of those brainstorming questions. Now we'll kind of look into some of the ones based on the reading and the work you, you did for your homework slash cl classwork assignment. So we look at this period of time in world history. A lot of people considered Europe to be a powder keg in the leads, years leading up to World War I. So a powder keg is simply a canister here or a barrel filled with, or a keg that holds gunpowder. And obviously if you have a keg that size filled with gunpowder, a little spark could just set it off and it can explode. So this referenced a very dangerous situation, in particular in the Balkan regions of southeastern Europe. You can see there the little pizza triangle kind of cut out there. That is the area in which the Balkan Peninsula, which is the powder keg, where there's a lot of nationalistic uprisings and a lot of harsh feelings during this period of time. Things like militarism and nationalism, the arms race, create a very dangerous and explosive situation in Europe prior to World War I. So when you look at some of the uh, descriptions there, Russia, they wanted a route to the Mediterranean Sea. So they wanted to, and you can see to the far right side of the triangle there, they wanted a outlet there from the Black Sea and into the Mediterranean Sea. Germany wanted to link to the Ottoman Empire. Austria-Hungary was angry at Serbia. Serbia, they, Serbia was trying to spark a Slavic revolution within the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Nine, how did aggressive nationalism contribute to international tension? Well, a lot of these empires, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the German Empire, these empires controlled many diverse groups of people who spoke different languages, had different ethnic backgrounds, different religions. And as a result, a lot of these groups wanted to be independent and free from the empire's control. So as a result, a lot of them began to move towards uprisings within the empires themselves. Their desire to be independent fueled tension throughout all of Europe. Ethnic Slavic groups wanted independence from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They wanted to create a greater Slavic nation. France, they wanted revenge on Germany, who during the Franco-Prussian War of 1871 took away some French territories, Alsace and Lorraine. The idea of social Darwinism had an impact on countries during this period of time. This idea of social Darwinism applies Darwin's theory to human society. This created competition amongst countries to dominate the globe with the strongest nation prevailing, almost survival of the fittest for countries. Militarism was a factor leading to war as well. It kind of glorified war. People believe that dis disagreement should be settled on the battlefield, not at the dip diplomatic table or through diplomacy. This also led to an arms race, no legs, just arms where they're trying to build up their military, trying to outdo each other. Leaders, soldiers, and citizens viewed warfare as glorious. There were several alliances that were formed prior to World War I. Now let's not confuse the alliances there's two different names for similar alliances. So the alliances that existed prior 
to World War I were the Triple Alliance and the Triple Entente. During the war, we had alliances with the Central Powers and the Allies. So the old alliance that was formed, the Triple Alliance, was actually helped and put together by Otto von Bismarck, the great German Chancellor. That was established in 1882. This included Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. To counter this alliance, the French became nervous as the Germans were forming allies or an alliance. They had the Triple Entente between France and Russia. Later on, Great Britain joined uh, the Triple Entente in 1904. France, Russia, and Great Britain would be on the side of the Allies eventually during World War I. In the case of the Central Powers, Germany and Austria-Hungary would be on the Central Powers. Uh, we'll learn about Italy later on, but they flip-flop swap sides during the war instead. Thirteen, how did the formation of the Triple Alliance and Triple Entente make an already tense situation in Europe even more explosive? Nations in Europe were not afraid of going to war because they knew they had powerful allies or friends to help them out. Additionally, a threat to one nation meant a threat to its allies as well, which made a greater world war more likely. Here's a map that uh, kind of looks at the war in Europe. You can see in the green are the allies, the light purplish color are the central powers, and the brownish color would be the neutral countries. And the one country to pay special attention to for neutrality is just north of Italy, Switzerland. It's abbreviated on the map. Switzerland tends to be a neutral country in most conflicts throughout history. If we were in class, we would do a map activity on this as well. Fourteen, what did the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary do on June 28, 1914? Well, he was hoping for a kind of a extension of a handshake, a hand, extending a hand of friendship towards the Slavic people who were kind of unhappy with the leadership of the empire at this point in time. So he decided he would visit what was pretty much the Slavic capital at that point in time, which was Sarajevo. Sarajevo being a predominantly Slavic city where nationalist feelings and anger towards the empire was high. It was kind of a dangerous scenario as we're going to see for the Archduke and his wife. But he thought it would be a diplomatic gesture that could kind of alleviate some of the tension. It backfired tragically for Ferdinand and his wife, Sophie. Ferdinand and Sophie were traveling in a parade route in a convertible car. A Serbian slash Bosnian terrorist group carried out a assassination plot against the Archduke and his wife. Their parade route had been published in the newspaper ahead of time, so they had assassins stationed at different points along the parade route. The first attempt to assassinate the Archduke and his wife failed. They tossed a bomb, but it had a delay on it. So it had like a five second delay. So it bounced off the car and instead of detonated, it kind of rolled behind, exploded, injuring a police officer who was following along the car. Instead of taking the Archduke and his wife to a you know, safe location and keeping them safe for the remainder of the day, they thought the danger had passed as they apprehended the original assassin who had tossed the bomb. They thought that was it. So the Archduke and his wife were still in the convertible car and traveling Sarajevo. Their driver made a wrong turn. And one of the co-conspirators and members of the Black Hand, Gavrilo Princip, had just taken a break, thought disappointingly that they had failed in their goal of assassinating, assassinating the Archduke. He couldn't believe to his surprise as he was on the corner of the street the Archduke's driver made a wrong turn, had to do like a K-turn and was slowly turning around right in front of Princip. He fired two shots, one into the Archduke, one into his wife, Sophie, killing both. 
So in many ways, when you think about the powder keg we had described before, the assassination of the Archduke and his wife is going to be exactly that spark that's going to set off the powder keg that's going to lead to the start of World War I. Seventeen, how did the Austrian Emperor Francis Joseph react to the assassination of his nephew, the Archduke? He sent a harsh ultimatum to Serbia. The demands were to surrender complete control of their country to Austria and Hungary. Of course, they refused. So instead, on July 28, 1914, one month after the assassination, after Serbia did not comply with the demands, Austria declared war on Serbia. How did the Austrian declaration of war lead to a world war? Well, we have a little visual here we can take a little closer look at. So once the war broke out, you can see Serbia is the smaller individual in the visual there. So here's Serbia. Austria declares war on Serbia. Russia, being allies with Serbia, declares war on Austria. Germany, being allies with Austria, declares war on Russia. France, being allies with Russia, declares war on Germany. And then far back is Great Britain, who eventually declares war on Austria, Hungary, and Germany to honor their alliance as well. So you can see here we read the little narrative. If you t touch me, I'll. If you make a move, I'll. If you hit that little fella, I'll. If you strike my friend, I'll. If you hit him, I'll. Hi there. If you don't, and that's the British getting in. So that's kind of the step by step how each of these countries got involved. And that's how we ended up having what could have been a small quick war probably between Austria, Hungary, and Serbia become a world war. Next, we'll look at some of the fighting techniques early on in the war. Explain some reasons why Germany invaded Belgium and then France in July of 1914. So Germany basically, as you can see, Germany is going to go through Belgium and then into France. Germany and France had a long-standing feud over the land of Alsace-Lorraine, which is border territory between the two countries. They are on opposing alliances even prior to the Great War, and Germany knew it must defeat France and Britain on the Western Front in order to win the war. So if we look at the map, we can see the two fronts. Eventually, the central powers, primarily Germany, with some help from Austria-Hungary, are going to invade Russia. They're going to dig in here on the Eastern Front. And then, as you can see here on the Western Front, they're going to come very close to getting to Paris, would be the central powers, primarily Germany, but they were put back about 30 miles from the capital city. They retreated a little bit, and then they would eventually build the trenches across the Western Front, right along the boundary between Germany and France. That's about a thousand miles of trenches on the Western Front. All right, 21, what were the two main fronts, which I alluded to just a moment ago? The Western Front fought mostly in France and on the German border between the French, ally, French and the Allies versus Germany and the Central Powers. On the Eastern Front, Eastern Europe, along the border with Germany and Russia, in which these two nations fought primarily. The Western Front would eventually turn into what is remembered as a stalemate. A stalemate is when neither side can get any territory. During World War I, defensive weapons were more effective than offensive weapons is one of the reasons for the stalemate. But primarily, the major reason for the stalemate on the Western Front will be the digging in of the trenches. Twenty-three trenches meant that soldiers could remain on the front line without retreating. It was extremely difficult for attacking soldiers to dislodge entrenched troops. This led to a lack of movement on the front lines, known as the stalemate. The stalemate along the Western Front remained virtually unchanged for four years during the war. You can see here the trenches are dug in. 
They're roughly the height of an average soldier. Twenty-four. What are the different parts to the trenches? You had offensive trenches, communication trenches, support trenches, barbed wire, and no man's land. So basically there's a similar trench design on the opposite side. So you have the two sides digging in very similarly in terms of their trench structures, the central powers and the allies. In between the two trenches would be an area remembered as no man's land. It's an area between the trenches where a lot of the firing and different armaments will be uh, fired. Before you could get to your enemy's trenches, there was a line of barbed wire, which would slow down an advancing army, slow enough that the military behind the lines there could fire upon the opposing army trying to get through the barbed wire, which made it very difficult to penetrate. Also, too, you had the forward listening post here. This is kind of so you can listen and see what might be coming from the opposite side, the communication trench. So you can kind of retreat and discuss and talk amongst different areas within the trenches. Support trenches where you can get food, supply, medical attention, things like that. Reserve trench as well, also towards the back of the line. All right, toes up. Looking at some of the problems in the trenches on a regular basis, you had extreme temperatures very hot temperatures during the summer, very cold temperatures during the winter. During the rainy season, the trenches filled up with water. And just thinking about when you're coming out of a pool after a long period of time, or you took a long bath, your fingers get kind of like shriveled up a little bit, kind of wrinkly looking. And that's only from a short period of time of the water. Imagine that there's water in your boot for days and weeks on end. And this led to a condition known as trench foot. And you can see the remnants there of remains from a gentleman who suffered from trench foot on the front lines. Basically, the foot began to rot away. Also, you had a lot of rats, lice, disease that spread through the trenches. People were living in tight quarters, so disease spread quite rapidly. There were many new methods of fighting in the trenches. You had machine guns, artillery, which is long-range guns, bigger guns, poison gas, tanks, zeppelins, which are like hot air balloons. They were used for spying and bombing. Submarines or U-boats. Airplanes, often bombing with bombs or steel darts even, flamethrower. One of the biggest issues, too, with using poison gas, as you can see the visual here, the big clouds of the poison gas, well, if the winds shifted after you fired the poison gas against your enemy, the gas could blow right back into your trench and injure or kill you and or your fellow soldiers. So it's kind of a dangerous weapon to use, poison gas. Now, as the war broke out from a United States perspective, we tried to remain neutral. President Wilson's reaction to World War I, he urged Americans to remain impartial in thoughts as well as actions. Isolationism or neutrality is what he emphasized. The official two sides during the war are two alliances that I had mentioned before. Central powers are the side that's opposite or opposed to the United States. This includes Germany, Austria, Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria. The allies are Great Britain, France, Russia, and the United States, who joined in 1917. When you think about how an average American citizen would decide who they would want to support during the war, often it came down to, if you were a recent immigrant to the United States from another country. It would come down to where you were from as to who you might support during the war. So for example, if you're a recent immigrant coming in from Germany, you're going to support the central powers. If you're a recent immigrant coming in from France, you would support the allied side.
There were different positions on what the United States should do during the war. So once the war broke out, a debate began to wage out within the United States. As different people weighed in on what they thought we should do. So you had two different extreme positions and one that was kind of more in the middle. The isolationists, they wanted to keep the United States out of the war and out of foreign conflicts in general, no matter what. They wanted to remain neutral or isolated from the war effort. Interventionalists, the United States should help the Allies would be their philosophy. And then the moderate position or the middle one was the internationalist. Believed America should actively work and cooperate and help to try and bring about peace without directly getting involved in the war. Our president, Woodrow Wilson at the time, was probably a internationalist, somebody who was looking to help out without directly getting involved in the war. Thirty-two. Why did the United States? Why did the United States find Germany's U-boat boats more problematic than the British naval blockade? The United States, as a former British colony, was more inclined to take the side of the British. German U-boats struck without warning and therefore were more threatening than the British Navy, which was above water. They sunk ships with civilians on them, often without warning. So the German U-boats were much more dangerous in the eyes of the American government. Next, we'll look at one of the more dramatic events leading up to American involvement in World War I. It was the sinking of the British ship, the Lusitania. The Lusitania was a British luxury cruise liner, one of the largest passenger ships in the world in 1915. It offered all the luxuries that wealthy passengers wanted during that period of time. Travelers would enjoy six days of dining and dancing as it headed from... New York to Great Britain in May of 1915. Interestingly enough, a warning appeared in a local New York Times newspaper on April 22nd, 1915. It was from the German government indicating that ships flying the British flag were subject to being sunk without warning. Passengers travel at their own risk. It was a direct warning to Americans not to get on the Lusitania, the Germans realized that if innocent American citizens were sunk potentially by a German submarine, that could create a lot of anger in the United States. Captain Turner was asked, he was the captain of Lusitania, about the idea that it could potentially be sunk. He said the Lusitania was the fastest ship in the world, it could not be sunk, and that the Threat from the Germans was one of the funniest jokes he had heard in years. Well, you know, that's not going to turn out too well for Captain Turner. Uh, The Lusitania was torpedoed and sunk by a German U-boat off the coast of Ireland. Nearly 1,200 men, women, and children died, of which 120 were Americans. This put a further strain on relations with the United States and Germany. So if you look there, that's kind of a diagram of the ship. Very similar to the Titanic. In fact, it was made on the same cruise line, meaning that the same assembly line put together the Titanic that put this ship together. Of course, the Germans believed the singular Lusitania was justified, while many Americans and the British were unhappy about the outcome. The Germans believed, and as history turned out, it was accurate that Lusitania was actually carrying ammunition and contraband at the very bottom of its ship, kind of hiding it or smuggling it across the Atlantic. Uh, The British were outraged because the Lusitania was a passenger ship, so the sinking resulted in many, many civilian deaths. Additionally, they believed the U boats fired upon it without adequate warning, so they would have been okay. Had everyone been able to evacuate in lifeboats and gotten off the ship, and then the ship was destroyed afterwards, but unfortunately, 1,200 people died. President Wilson was outraged, so as a result, the Germans issued what is remembered as the Sussex Pledge in 1916, 
The Germans declared in 1916 after another incident, they pledged not to sink unarmed ships. So Americans accepted that, and we avoided going to war at that point in time. However, we're going to see another step taken by the Germans that's going to finally turn around American public opinion for good. Who was Arthur Zimmerman? What was his proposal? He was the German foreign minister to Mexico, kind of like the Secretary of State here for the United States today, you know, somebody who represents Germany in a foreign country. He sent a telegram, remembered as the Zimmerman note or the Zimmerman telegram, offering Mexico the opportunity to form a secret alliance by joining the Central Powers. Germany promised that if they joined the Central Powers, that they would help the Mexican government regain control of the southwestern United States. The, Germ uh, the Mexicans still felt that that was Mexican territory that was stolen away from them during the Mexican-American War. You can see the two visuals there, kind of cartoons. One is uh, carving up southwestern United States for Mexico again. The visual on the right side is a German speaking to a Mexican, talking about join with Germany, and you get a bit of the United States. So that was uh, two visuals kind of indicating what the Germans and Mexicans were planning. Thirty-seven. what did the British do after they intercept it and decode it, the Zimmerman telegram or note? They informed the United States of the plan in hopes of getting President Wilson to join the war on the side of the Allies. Americans found the Zimmerman note very threatening. The idea that the United States was trying to avoid the war seemed unlikely now at this point in time. The United States did not want other countries interfering in the Western Hemisphere. And then the Zimmerman note showed that the war could come quite quick, quickly to American shores. On April 2nd, 1917, Woodrow Wilson asked Congress to declare war. He said, we need to declare war to make the world safe for democracy. Its peace must be planted upon the tested foundations of political liberty. So the United States finally abandoned our isolationist and neutral positions and prepped to join World War I. After the United States declared war, what did they need to do next? They needed to mobilize. They needed to recruit, train millions of soldiers, and transport them across the Atlantic. A very ambitious task. And lastly, the lesson reflection. What were, why were new technologies and weapons for war both a net positive and a net negative during World War I? The new weapons advanced warfare to a more modern stage in the history of warfare. New technologies would eventually require fewer soldiers, which is a net positive. However, the biggest net negative is that casualty numbers were much higher. That's it for now. And until next time, Mr. Clark is out.